Greetings, differential equation scholars, and welcome back to another installment on our series from section 7.1 of your text, where we've begun to explore the definition of the Laplace transform. Now, in our previous video, we showed that using the definition of the Laplace transform, we could take a function. Here in our previous example, it was the constant function three. And by evaluating a special improper integral, we could transform that function into another function, which we found in the previous video was three over s. We changed a function, a function of t, into a function of s. And this is uh, what we refer to as an integral transformation. Whereby by applying a certain, applying and evaluating a certain improper integral, we can begin with one function of one variable t and end up with another function of a variable s. And notice the notation here. We usually use the lowercase letter to denote the function that's being transformed, like three. And then we denote the function uh, in its transformed form using an uppercase letter, like capital F. All right. Well, let's remind ourselves how we did that transformation. And this is our definition right here. The definition of a Laplace transform of a function little f of t, uh, we write it with this notation. We use the script L and uh, we put curly brackets uh, around the function that we're transforming. We say that the Laplace transform of this function of t is the result of this improper integral here, integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus st times uh, f of t, the integral of that product function with respect to t provided the integral converges. Provided that integral does exist and does converge, we call the result of that improper integral the Laplace transform of the function little f of t. Okay, well, let's take a look another, at another example of applying that definition here. Today, I want to take a look at the question of this transformation right here. What is the Laplace transform of the exponential of 5t? What is the Laplace transform of e to the 5t? Um, when we substitute e to the 5t in for f of t, I set f of t to be equal to e to the 5t in my improper integral, what is the resulting function, if any, that I get? So let's take a look at the analysis of that here. Here's the expression. I have replaced the f of t with e to the 5t. So we have the improper integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus st. And that is always there at the beginning, the e to the minus st. It's part of the definition of the Laplace transform. We want to take the improper integral from, from 0 to infinity of e to the minus st times e to the 5t dt. That's the expression we want to try to evaluate. So that's, of course, an improper integral. It has an upper limit of infinity. So we have to use the definition of the improper integral to rewrite that. What that really is, is it's a limit. It's a limit if we replace that upper limit infinity with the constant b, then what that really means is it's the limit as b approaches infinity of the integral from zero to b of e to the minus st times e to the 5t dt. Now let's use some properties of, of exponents because We've got e to the minus st and e to the 5t. Properties of exponents say that 
those exponents will just add together. So we'll get e to the 5t minus st. And we could factor a t out of that expression to get e to the 5 minus s times t. So by using properties of exponents, that's really the function that we are anti-differentiating uh, between 0 and b. Well, it's not very hard to do. That's an exponential. Uh, since it's e to the a t, uh, in general, the, the antiderivative of e to the a t uh, is going to be 1 over a times e to the a t. So here, our antiderivative is 1 over 5 minus s times e to the 5 minus s t. That's my antiderivative of the exponential. And Fundamental theorem of calculus says I want to evaluate that at the upper limits and the lower limit and see what I get. So let's make those substitutions. Remember that we're integrating with respect to t. That's very important here. The variable s is constant here. It is not the variable of integration. It is t that we're integrating with respect to. And so when we do our substitution, we're substituting in for t. At the upper limit, we're going to replace t with b. And at the lower limit, that's our upper limit. And at our lower limit, we're going to replace t with 0. So when I do that, you see here we've got that expression, my antiderivative expression first with the t replaced with b, and then with the t replaced with 0. Now, at the lower limit, when t is 0, that's just going to make the exponent 0. And so we'll have e to the zeroth, which is just one. Now, notice what I've done here. I've done a little bit of algebra going from this step to this step. Uh, in the second piece, uh, we have the negative of one over five minus s. I've rewritten minus one over five minus s as plus one over s minus five. They are, of course, of course algebraically and arithmetically equivalent to one another. Also, in this first expression here, you'll notice that I've written e to the 5 minus s times b as e to the negative of s minus 5 times b. Those two are, of course, also algebraically equivalent to one another. Now, as we go to think about what this limit might be, Obviously, this second piece here is a constant with respect to b. So the limit of that is just 1 over s minus 5. But what about this first piece here? Does this first piece here even have a limit? Well, that depends very greatly on the exponent there. We would need to make sure that that exponent, um, that that exponential expression has a limit. Now we know that the function e to the minus a t does have a limit of zero um, pro, as t goes to infinity, provided that, um, that uh, the constant a uh, is positive. So what we need to make sure here is that s minus five times b is positive. Well, b certainly is positive. It's approaching positive infinity. But what about s minus five? Well, for that to be positive, we're going to need to have s greater than 5. Provided that s is bigger than 5, then s minus 5 would be bigger than 0. And that's going to ensure uh, the necessary ingredients to have this first piece um, have a limit of 0. So we need to make the restriction that s is greater than 5 here. Uh, if you go back to the original integral, you can certainly see why that's the case. Think about this integral right here. We step back a couple of steps. Think about what happens for that if s is 5 or less. Well, if s is equal to, to 5 in that integrand expression right there, wouldn't you have just e to the 0, which is 1, being integrated? Well, if you integrate a constant function 1, uh, from zero to infinity, you certainly are not going to have a finite amount of area underneath the constant function one. Similarly, if I take s to be a value that's less than five, suppose I take s to be four, for example, then I'd have e to the one t. Well, 
Well, e to the t, that exponential curve, that certainly doesn't have a finite amount of area underneath it either as t goes from zero to infinity. So it's crucial here that we do make the restriction that s is greater than five. Provided we do that, that first piece of the integral will indeed approach zero in the limit. So in these two pieces here, this first piece right here can and will approach zero, provided again that we assume that s is bigger than five. If it does, then the only thing that survives a limit, you might say, is this. We'll have a limit of zero plus one over s minus five. And therefore, we found the Laplace transform. We have found the function of s that we got uh, when we evaluate that improper integral. And what did we just learn? We learned that when we substitute in this for our f of t, if our f of t is e to the 5t in our integral, then the result of that integral is 1 over s minus 5. So we now have a result that the Laplace transform of e to the 5t is 1 over s minus 5. Very interesting. Now, if you were to repeat that exercise with different constants here in front of the t, like e to the 3t or e to the 12t uh, or e to the minus 4t, what you will find when you do that is that you can just replace that constant there with anything. And in general, we have a, uh, an important general result here that follows from the same logic that we just did. Just as e to the 5t has a Laplace transform of 1 over s minus 5, in general, the Laplace transform of e to the kt is going to be 1 over s minus k for any constant k. So if somebody said, what is the Laplace transform? And we want to know what's the Laplace transform of e to the 7t. What are we going to get when we evaluate that improper integral? Well, in this case, provided in this case that s is bigger than 7, the Laplace transform for that would be 1 over s minus 7. If somebody said, what is the Laplace transform? for just e to the t, taking k to be equal to 1, that would tell us, of course, that we had a transform of function of 1 over s minus 1. Somebody said, what is the Laplace transform of e to the minus 2t. Well, there the constant k is minus 2. And so we'll have 1 over s minus negative 2, which would really be 1 over s plus 2. Those are some Laplace transforms for various exponential functions. And remember that those apply uh, provided that uh, s is appropriately restricted. So uh, provided s is bigger than 7, this is true. Provided s is bigger than 1, this is true. Provided s is bigger than negative 2, that is true. So now we have uh, yet another result for a Laplace transform. In our next video coming up, we're going to take a look at a very important and valuable property of Laplace transforms known as the linearity property. And we'll see how we can use this property to uh, and the Laplace transforms of certain basic functions to build up the Laplace transforms of more complicated functions using a very, very useful property known as the linearity property. 
and we're going to discuss that uh, in our upcoming video tomorrow, video number three, on the linearity property of the Laplace transform.